Hello, this is Mikey Gay from Scratch, and welcome to another in the Closer Look at Game Engine series. Today we are looking at the Autodesk Stingray Game Engine. Now, the Closer Look series combines the best of a preview, a review, and a getting started tutorial to try and give you as quickly as possible as much information about a game engine if it's a right fit for you or not. So instead of having to spend weeks evaluating an engine, you can spend less than an hour here. Now, I've done a, several of these on Game From Scratch, both on my YouTube channel and on the webpage, generally in text and in video form, and they're available at GameFromScratch.com. Just click on Game Engines, and you'll find several different game engines that have been covered in this manner. At the same time, there will be a text-based version of this particular review down below in the comments. So without further ado, let's jump on in. Today what we're covering again is the Stingray engine from Autodesk. Now this started life as something called the BitSquid engine from a company called Fat Shark, probably most famous for making uh, the Magicka series of games. Uh, but that's not it. This game's actually been used in, let's, we'll call it a-level uh, game development. It was recently used for Warhammer Vermintide, for example. So it is production tested. This is very much a real thing engine. Back in 2014, Autodesk bought up BitSquid. And then since then, they've brought it in-house, integrated a number of their internal technologies, such as uh, navigation, beast, scale form, etc., into this package, and now they're releasing it as a game engine. Now, the game engine is is not free. So that's one of those things we should cover right off the hop. And in this day and age, a lot of people are getting used to free or royalty based. This is not royalty based. This is not free. This is 100% subscription based. And the subscription costs, dun, 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 $240 a month or $30 a month if paid monthly. Now, before you get too up and tight about that particular price, that's not actually what anyone would ever buy. Nobody is going to license Stingray directly or almost nobody is going to because it is bundled into Maya LT. And here you can get it for $30 a month or $240 a year. So exact same pricing in Maya LT, but Maya LT includes access to the Stingray 3D game engine. So Maya LT is a stripped down version of Maya. Now Maya is a digital content creation 3D application that's been around forever. Uh, way, way back in the beginnings of the 3D industry, there was a company called Alias and there was another company called Wavefront. Those two companies merged together, became Alias Wavefront, a lot of original thinking there, and they released a product called Power Animator. Power Animator lived for many, many years as an Alias Wavefront product and eventually was redone, rewritten, ported to Windows, and released as Maya. Since then, Maya has evolved many, many times and has since been purchased by Autodesk, and now they continue to sell Maya, but they also offer Maya LT. Now, Maya LT is an indie game developer-focused, stripped-down version of Maya. They've taken out some of the uh, dynamics, the uh, particle systems, some of the stuff that you would use for motion pictures, etc., have all been ripped out. So mostly what you've got left in there is the modeling, the animation, and I believe the rendering. So it is a streamlined version of their high-end product. And don't get me wrong, Maya has a $4,000 plus price tag. So Maya LT is definitely a deal if you want it. So if you want it, you're essentially getting Stingray for free and they've integrated the two together tightly. So if you want to use and get your content into a game engine, well, that's normally the weak link for many game engines. But since Autodesk owns uh, Maya, owns Stingray, owns the FBX file format that is used for interchange between them, it's probably got the most seamless interchange you're gonna find amongst game engines. Uh, so that is where you gotta take the price to effect. Now there's another big thing where I'm gonna lose some of you immediately. Stingray runs, the tools, run on Windows 7, 8, and 10, sort of. Um, so there is no uh, Mac OS support, there is no Linux support. So if you're looking for either of those for developing content, I am sorry, you are out of luck. Now when it comes to content deployment, uh, Stingray supports the following targets. Uh, iOS, Android, Windows, Xbox One with a developer license, PS4 with a developer license, and Oculus Rift and HTC Vive as far as VR headsets go. So there are a couple of major missing pieces there. No Mac OS, no Linux, no HTML5. So if those are required platforms, again, you're out of luck. So that is an overview of Maya in terms of uh, 
you know, broad capabilities and a little bit of history lesson and the platforms it runs on. Now let's actually jump in and fire it up. Now for this particular release, I am using entirely the um, evaluation version. You can get a 30 day trial and that is actually what I am using in this particular case. I am running the free trial. This actually means I have no access to the underlying C++ code. So if you are a subscriber, you do get access to the C++ code so you can uh, extend it, you can expose it to their um, built in coding systems, etc. And that is how the programming works here. This is not really a C++ engine. You can write in C++, but the primary programming languages for working in Stingray are Lua and Flow. And I will cover both of those in this review. Now, if you want to work with C++, you can. It's there. I can't cover it. I don't have it. And that's actually not really how things are meant to be. You're supposed to extend those. You extend the platform of the tools using C++, but you ultimately should expose it out to either Lua or Flow and continue to create your game that way. All right, so let's fire up Stingray. Now, before I get too far in, I want to mention a couple of negatives that I've already haven't covered. Uh, first off, this, I don't understand it, but it makes me disable arrow composition. I've never actually seen a Windows 10 application do that. Uh, so I don't know what's up there, but that is definitely a thing. Now, another thing, and this irritates the hell out of me. Uh, so if you're from Autodesk watching this, auto remove, add, remove program. There we go. This is what I wanted somewhat awkwardly. When this guy installed, it created two egregious sins in my opinion. First off, it left droppings um, off of my C root, and I hate that. It's possible I might have screwed up part of the install process, but basically I installed it to a different location and the, the installer left this temporary behind, and I can't stand that. But more than anything, I can't stand this. The Akamai Net Session Interface Background Service was installed as part of this installation. And I don't believe I ever said, go ahead and do this. I don't like this. I consider this guy just one step up from malware. As soon as I'm done this evaluation, this piece of crap is being removed from my system. Don't do this, Autodesk. Just don't do it. I imagine they're using this as some kind of a downloader to make, I don't know at what level they're using it. But don't, don't leave this persistent, always running crap on our computers that is running when your application is not. I hate you for doing this. Everybody hates you for doing this. You are the reason why PCs slow down over time. Please just stop. All right, so a minor gripe, obviously one that really annoys me, but definitely just a minor gripe. This is your launcher for a Stingray project. And they've got a couple of templates built in, basically, um, you know, set up and pre-configure a project for you. Uh, first off, we're going to go ahead and look at this guy. So there is an empty project. We're going to come back and look at it in a little bit. Uh, but we've also got this, um, this character one here, and that's what we're going to start with. Uh, there's a, a VR and a vehicle rig set up, um, a basic one that gives you, um, you know, kind of a simple walk camera setup and to go from there. Uh, but this guy's a little bit more advanced, so we'll start with that. And we'll go ahead and create one. Uh, YouTube 90210. I've created a couple of these, so I don't want a name collision. And run. This video actually in recording it has been mildly cursed. I ran out of hard drive space one time. Uh, I had my computer just shut down for some particular reason one time. And one time my mic was not on. So this is uh, the fourth time I've recorded this guy. So hopefully this one goes a little bit better. Uh, here we are. There's a tutorial launch. It's all pretty simple stuff. We'll get into the documentation a little bit later on. And what you'll find now is it's um, pre-compiling the data required here. This can take uh, a minute or two, but there's no sense of me just sitting here in awkward silence while this compilation finishes. So I'm just going to go ahead and pause it. Now be aware, this only happens the first time you create a new project. So it's not uh, something you need to be concerned with. So I'll be back in a second. Alrighty then, welcome to two to three minutes into the future and the uh, pre-processing work is done. This is the Stingray Editor. Now I want to say something right off the hop. This is clean. This is a very streamlined, clean, nice to work with game editor. I have to give them credit, they are big time. Um, the performance is pretty good. Uh, the customizability is amazing. We'll see that in a second. I, I have some issues where it um, wasn't drawing or wasn't updated. I had to minimize, maximize the window or similar things. But for the most part, this is the most clean of the engines out there. Now, um, Unreal Engine comes very close. Unity is starting to get very long in the tooth in my humble opinion. But this guy is a very, very clean interface. Now you see, you got your primary viewport where you drag and drop, uh, you know, create your scenes, build up your scene graph, etc. But let me just show you how customization works here. We've got a number of tabs across this particular view. We've got this uh, help link attached. Get rid of that. Um, but you'll notice here we've got the tabs here for different 
features and functionalities. We can click here and add a variety of different windows directly in there. Nothing really special so far. Uh, we can resize windows to our heart's content, but where it gets impressive is the amount that we can actually, we can move tabs over easily enough. We can float tabs, move them off to separate monitors if we wish, close them down completely. Uh, we can merge them down like so, or we could collapse everything into one gigantic tab if we wished. So this is a very, very, very customizable user interface. And I have just turned it into something that is virtually useless. So the nice thing is you can also come up here and reset your layout and be back to where you were a second later. You know, as you also probably saw, you can save and load your layout. So if you have configurations you like for particular things, set them up, do whatever you want with them, load out that configuration. You want to switch to, um, you know, scripting mode, you can switch it out and off the races. It's got very good multi-monitor support, etc. Now where it does fall on its face a little bit is high DPI support. And I'm kind of getting used to this point at Windows. Windows did a crap job of supporting HDPI monitors in the first place. And this application does a pretty good, this is actually running at 2040, uh, 2440 by 16 something or other. So this is an HDPI mode uh, that is running now. And for the most part, it's pretty good. And it's gonna, you're gonna lose a little bit when they downstamp this to 1080p, but you will find that some of the applications, such as this guy, don't work well uh, and are strangely laggy. Now on top of that, I also had a few issues where I had um, uh, windows that were off screen, windows that were, uh, oh, here I'll actually bring it up. So there you can see our windows are extremely small. Uh, the canvas works properly, uh, so that part's nice, but there are gonna be some issues where you're going to have high DPI issues. Uh, but I had it where I opened some windows and I literally couldn't get them off the screen. So here, let me, actually, I think it was, uh, which guy was it? Mm, okay, I'm not remembering exactly which one it was. It might have been property yet. Yeah, there you go. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that window. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's the title is off, I can't move it around because it's off the screen at the top, it's off the screen at the bottom. I can't resize it, I can't do anything with it. And fun fact, it's actually when I close down this application and start it back up, uh, this lovely window will be on top of us again. So there are some issues with high DPI. Also, when you run your uh, project for the first time by clicking this guy, this is how you uh, test an application. It's not a full run. Uh, okay, it worked that time. I had this guy drawing off the bottom right hand corner, uh, which causes issues because uh, you don't have mouse focus, so you can't grab the title window. Uh, but if you do this and you have a window that is off screen on you, that trusty reset layout will come to your rescue. Just be aware though, there are some high, high definition monitors issues here. And in this day and age, which is kind of strange, because I don't imagine the majority of people doing uh, high end game development are running on very high definition monitors by this point. So I'm shocked when I don't see it, but the primary editor itself does not have issues other than a couple of windows you pop up. So just make you aware of that. All right, back to the interface. We'll do a little bit of a quick guided tour. Up here, what you see is the primary uh, you know, representation of our view. If you've worked in a, uh, an Autodesk product, you probably already know the hotkeys. Uh, this is your move, scale, rotate, uh, and this is the placement tool. They are controlled using the QWERT hotkeys. Uh, next up, you have um, grid snapping and you have rotation stepping. Uh, you have these two options. One is a test, which we just saw earlier, kind of quick runs your level in the um, in a uh, an application window, or this one, uh, which actually runs it, which is what you have to use if you want to debug. Uh, so that is your viewport. You can drag things in, create them here, etc. This is where you will ultimately place your scenes. I will go ahead and load a scene in a second, so it will make a bit more sense. But you can see a couple of the items in the screen. So, like for example, we have this uh, sunlight. Uh, unit up here in this um, empty scene that we've got going. Down here is your asset browser. This is where the contents of your world are organized. Um, you got some options here. Let me just bring that guy up a bit. So you got your various search. Uh, you can filter out what you see. It's right here. You can filter down to specific assets. You can search right here. Uh, you can change the um, view mode right here. We'll go down to smaller icons, so I've got a bit more room to play with. Uh, and for example, I'm going to jump into the contents and we'll load a level up here. So uh, main menu, 
like so. So this is the main menu of this game. It doesn't really make a lot of sense because we're facing the wrong direction, which gives me the ability to cover the camera controls now. So camera control is Alt and then mouse button combination. So Alt, left mouse button is an orbit, like so. Alt, middle mouse button is a pan. Alt, right mouse button is it's kind of a zoom, but it's not actually a zoom. Uh, this is tracking, I think. And then Alt and middle mouse button is, in fact, zoom. Are they the same thing? Yeah, I guess they are. All right, so Alt, right, alt, right mouse button and uh, scroll wheel do the same thing there. Uh, you'll notice here, this is where, again, you organize the various pieces of your, the, the building materials that go into making up your game. Go down here in the asset browser. So you see we've got uh, the level that we just loaded. I can grab something in the level, and we'll, we'll get back to this guy over here in a second. Uh, but as you grab things that make sense, so example, if I go into a material and pick a black material, you'll see it over here in the preview window. Uh, same way as I go into the models here and pick a model such as our character, like so, you can see it down here. And again, the same controls for uh, the, the 3D viewport apply down here. Now back to the viewport for a second. There's a couple things I missed here that I should go back into. Uh, you'll notice in the top left corner here, you've got a set of... Uh, various menus that you can drop down. So you can click here and you can change how it draws. So you can always draw or when in focus, etc. Change how uh, audio rendering is done. You can change the rendering settings. I think that you can toggle uh, various uh, overlays, uh, informational overlays off over right here. At the same time, if you come up here to this top right hand corner, this switches back and forth between your quad view, like so. So that, I should have covered that the first time. Sorry, I missed it. Anyways, back to the asset browser down here. This is, again, where you just organize the various things that go in your game. At the same time, you want to bring something into your game, such as an FBX model or a texture or something. Just click import and go and find it. It will figure out context sensitively by the thing you are passing in, what it is, and take the appropriate action. And as you saw here, when you have an item selected, if it makes sense, it is shown in this preview window over here. But the same, this is actually just this window, again, uh, focused directly on the item being previewed. So you got the same settings, the same abilities are down here that you do up with this window. Uh, now, we can also show something like, here is a skeleton. And if I double click the skeleton, it will bring up this handy viewer. This basically is just showing you your, um, your underlying skeleton, the hierarchy of nodes supported. Like so, now what you will find is you really can't do anything here. You can uh, preview your animations like I am here. However, you cannot actually make changes or edits. It's expected you'll do your content creation over in Maya or Maya LT or 3D Studios Max or whatever. Now, I have successfully brought in some FBX files from Blender, uh, but I haven't played with the animation stuff yet, so I don't know if there's a gigantic fight there. But you can bring in FBX content created in other platforms. But the things like animation, um, making animations, etc., it is all expected to be done and tweaked and finished in your content creation tool, not within the editor itself. All right, so that is this. Let's go take a look quick at the log console. This guy is actually somewhat invaluable. This is where your error messages, your informational details, etc., are all shown. You can press this guy to clear the console. Um, you can filter out for um, you know data versus. Let's just bring that list up. So we can filter down to see which ones we're actually interested in. So if I don't care about the data compiler, I can turn that off and not get those results. Uh, this is also where your Lua console is by default. So if you want to see output from your own code, it will be down there. So the log console will probably be up on your device quite often. Uh, we already saw the asset previewer. Um, not really much else to explain. It's basically just a mini viewport that's already configured. Uh, we've got up here is the level flow. Uh, this is cool. We'll get to it later. Uh, so pretend it's not there. Uh, so now back with our level selected. Yeah, let's just loop around again. So this is ultimately the 3D file behind a simple menu. If I go ahead and play it, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So go ahead and run it. And this is what this is ultimately creating. And you've got a start and quit option. You press start and it goes to the next level, uh, which is your game controlled by ASDF keys. Hopefully that's not too, too loud. And you can shoot. Kind of the extent of the demo. Uh, you can switch between first and third person by hitting the F2 key and escape to exit. 
So that is the default starting game that it's, it's shipping with that you, if you want to play around with. And then you can see here is the one scene already being rendered. This is your main menu. It loads the other scene as part of its logic, but we could just as easily switch to the other scene, which is somewhat confusingly called character. And there you start seeing things being placed in the world. So we've got various assets such as uh, this thingy selected or these navigation points selected, etc. If you come up here, you will now see the next part we have Explorer. Explorer should probably be called Scene Graph. I wish everyone would just standardize it calling it a Scene Graph because damn it, it's a Scene Graph. So this is your Scene Graph. And what it's done is it's broken down your entities, your units, and uh, various other environmental objects such as lights. So this is the stuff in your game world. Now, one of the things that I find quite confusing with Stingray, and I think this is a transitional thing, they have an entity component system, and that has kind of become the universal norm. Uh, Unity kind of made that the thing. Uh, you know, everything at the base is a game object, which is a container for components, which in turn make up the various aspects of your entities in the world in reusable, nice Lego-like bits. So that is the entity component system in the most basic nutshell you've ever heard. And they've got that here. Uh, so for example, here is an entity uh, that is the shading environment, which is made up of components such as Bloom, Vignette, Color Grading, uh, etc. So you can compose these entities out of, unfortunately, it's only for a very small subset of things. Now, I think what happened is uh, BitSquid, the previous engine, built everything around the idea of a unit, which you can think of in um, Unreal Engine terms as an actor, or as in every other game engine as a scene node. It's the basic entity in your game. So all these things you're seeing, this guy, this guy, this guy, etc., they are units. So grab the wall, see that? It's a unit. Target. It's a unit, unit, platform, unit. So that guy's a unit. That is what all these things are. They're units. So the basic building block of Stingray was the unit. And it looks like they're trying to transition slowly to an entity component system. And it creates this weird sort of double scene graph dichotomy thing going on. So if you're a little confused, most of the things that go in your game are ultimately going to be units. And units are a lot like um, entity component systems, but you just can't pick the components. Uh, so they're pre-configured for you. You can see down here, uh, there is a transform component, uh, a material, a hookup for beast, which is a lighting system made by um, Autodesk, part of what they bundled in here, and script link. So they have, so again, we also have under beast, has these different pieces as well. It's kind of like a pre-configured component approach, which kind of defeats the purpose of almost every single component system, because the reuse, etc., is not really there. Configurability is not really there. But that's kind of the way things go. However, what we're seeing here is as we select things in the world, uh, the Explorer is the graph of all of those things, and the property editors is the dynamic properties for that particular instance. So, um, like you say, we can set the, trans, um, the transformation here, etc. cetera. Uh, we have the link back to uh, the material that's collected to this guy. So we could go to, go to the resource. You see, there's the material attached to this guy. Um, so a property view and a scene graph is a pretty common thing out there in the world of game engines, and this one is absolutely no exception, except for that whole weird split between some things are entities and some things are units. Very kind of confusing. And I actually find the, the choice of the word unit was a little confusing as well, to be honest. I like actor a lot better than unit, but that's also, again, personal opinion. So just be aware, when you hear the word unit, think of that as node or scene node or actor or placeable object or drawable or however you want to think about it. But the things that make up your game are essentially units. Uh, some of the things that configure your game, such as the environment, are entities. And entities can contain various different components. And I think over time, they're going to transition to and add more components. So essentially, that is a roundabout of the user interface. The interface is quite clean, quite easy, quite, um, you know, again, clean. Clean is the magic word here. Now, we've come down here. We can see there's a lot of other standalone editors that are of some importance. Uh, what I want to talk about quite quickly are Weiss Audio, Navigation Lab, and Scaleform Studio. Those three guys are, well, Weiss, well, Weiss, is it well, Weiss? We'll go with well, Weiss. Uh, well, Weiss is a standalone third-party audio solution, but if you need to do uh, fancy, funky audio stuff, um, uh, placeable audio, advanced effects, etc., it's done in well, Weiss Audio. It's, it's included with this guy uh, as a scale form, as a navigation lab. Navigation lab is essentially a pathfinding or AI solution. Uh, so that's part of where these little guys right here kick in. These are um, navigation nodes uh, for 
uh, helping the code for navigating the scene. Um, so the, between the navigation nodes and creating the, the nav mesh for the, the platform itself, uh, that comes down to uh, Autodesk's existing solution navigation. And that's how you can integrate into the external application. And then finally, we've got Scaleform, which I'll go ahead and load. Scaleform is another product from Autodesk. This actually started life as, you can basically think of it as Flash for games. It was a special implementation of uh, the Flash player or the Flash runtime, specifically designed to be embedded in games. And this guy is popular. Um, it has been used for the UI for AAA games for 10 years plus, has been used in more AAA games than I care to even count, uh, you can go to the website to find more. I can think of one right off the top of my head was the reboot of Deus Ex used it. Uh, but hundreds of games use it. Basically, if there's a fancy animated um, complex 2D overlaid GUI, that is done in Scaleform. And as I said, Scaleform is a funky version of Flash designed and created specifically for games. However, and this is going to be very, very relevant to Stingray, Scaleform is also their proposed solution for 2D games. So. Stingray is not a 2D engine, period. It's just not. It can be in 3D, just like any other 3D engine. You can fake it into doing 2D, but none of the logic is there. There's no 2D collision detecting. You use 3D and try and fake it so that it works right, so it doesn't spin on the opposite axis, etc. All of the stuff you will be doing is hitting it with a hammer to try and make it fit. It is not a 2D engine. It is a full 3D engine. However, it supports Scaleform. And Scaleform has been increasingly been positioned as a 2D engine in addition to a UI layer. So you can tightly integrate the results of Scaleform into um, Stingray if you wish. So you can have it uh, communicate with Stingray's Lua. Uh, you can use it as uh, the overlay for their thing. You could create your entire game in it if you want. And for some reason, use Stingray for data on the back end. So if you are looking at a 2D engine here, you're actually more using Stingray than you are using, sorry, you're more using Scaleform than you are using Stingray. However, the license is included. So as part of that 30 bucks, you are ultimately getting Scaleform embedded in your Stingray game. So if you wanted to go down that road, it is another option, but that is way beyond what I want to talk about here. I mostly just want you to know that this guy, Stingray, as it stands out of the box, is not a 2D game engine, does not have 2D functionality, and if you want 2D, you ultimately use Scaleform, which is bundled, but it is essentially a separate 2D game engine that you can embed. So I want you to be aware of that right up front. And so for 2D games, potentially even 2.5D, unless it's just 3D with a fixed perspective camera, you're probably better off using a different game engine or just Scaleform itself. I'm not really sure what Stingray brings to that equation if you were just doing a 2D game in Stingray. There might be logic behind it. I don't particularly know it. Uh, but you'll find that a lot of the functionality here has been offloaded to these other programs, and they are nicely integrated, tightly packed in. And then other than that, we've got a number of different things we can see here. We've got um, advanced debugger options. We can do remote debugging. Um, we can connect through the Lua code console remotely, etc. Very nice, handy stuff. Uh, we can create flows external to Stingray for some reason. So if you want to do your flow programming outside of Stingray, uh, that is an option. You can also do it for level flows. Um, uh, there's an, an advanced console that's standalone. Uh, we can go back to the navigation stuff, which actually is remarkably unexciting, but here's your just your top level settings for uh, generating nav mesh. If you don't know, a nav mesh is basically a polygon surface basically that says you can walk here and you can't walk there. It's, they're essential to pretty much every 3D game engine out there, and that's how you go about actually creating your nav mesh. But you can also go into this navigation lab for advanced settings or uh, different features. And then we got the unit editor, which we will see shortly. We've got a uh, script editor, which is we will also see shortly. Uh, we got the story editor, which is for doing cutscenes and such. Um, I never actually figured out how to use it, if I'm honest, so we're not going to cover that one that much. Uh, but it is a way of doing basically keyframed in engine uh, animations and sequences, audio queuing, etc., for creating cutscenes. And then finally, we come over here, we have the deployer and connections. Deployer is where you would go about creating and bundling your game for various platforms. As you can see, we can create it for Windows, Android, iOS, PS4, and then, of course, you're still going to need a PS4 developer license and Xbox One, and again, you're going to need a PS4 developer license. Okay, so that is essentially the tools in uh, working with Stingray. Now, I'm going to do things slightly out of order from um, my uh, text version, and I'm actually going to show you how to bring content into Stingray, and then we'll do some coding on top of it. In order to do this, I'm actually going to start up a new blank project. I'm going to show you a couple things with this one. 
First off, I always call Stingray Stringray, which is very irritating. Uh, all right, so we're gonna create a new one. Or you know what? I'll go with the one I already created. So I'll show you the code as opposed to you know having you watch me type it. And this particular example shows creating a Lua game from scratch. Now there's something I want you to see here, very important. Uh, this PC, drive D, dev. So this is where I actually installed Stingray 2, right here. All right, so here's your default Stingray install. If you come into here, what you will find is core. A core could be essentially thought of as a game engine written in Lua on top of Stingray. And I will show you exactly what I mean in a second as um, Visual Studio Code opens this guy up. All right, so here's the various folders and libraries and, and bits that are basically coded in Lua. So if you go with the basic project, it will automatically link into this. It will link into, um, uh, where did you go? App Kit, Lua. So there's a starter app right here. So simple project. So this is kind of going to get you up and going. They've kind of implemented a Lua game on top of their engine to quickly, easily get you up and going. And then you inherit from this guy and implement the things that are specific to you. So this is the logic of your game. And it's a skeleton to work out from. Uh, it's quite simple. And then on top of here, you can see several um, Lua libraries. This is the Lua bindings available to basically wrap over the Stingray engine and expose it in Lua. So you can get a pretty good idea of what's there. So Human IK is the inverse kinematic system made by um, Autodesk that's been bundled in. You come in here, you see Lua. And here is the um, Lua bindings per se for dealing with Human IK. And we go through all that. We got things to access editor, we got things to access units, cameras. So here we're going to units, which is a very important type. So you can see all the various built-in units, you know, the lights, cube maps, cameras, etc. cetera, uh, built-in basic primitives, which I actually didn't actually show you. Uh, but the code is all here. The underlying guts are all here in Lua. So if you wanna dive in, deep dive, get started quickly, there is a lot of a framework to build on top of here. On that hand, this guy used none of it. This is the roll from scratch solution. And I always like to do this. I'd like to see what the basic hello world is in a game engine so you can understand it from that level. And that's essentially what I've done here. This is a implementation of the minimalist game. So you just came in, create a new game, empty. Now the first thing you do, it's kind of a data-driven engine. So you've got uh, this boot file, uh, which is Luo configured, and it's got the various different packages and settings going. And what I've done is I came in here and I set up Thought I set up. All right, one second. I'm getting off the script here. All right, my bad. I was in uh, boot instead of settings. So you go into your settings file in the root, and I just set up this guy called boot script. You can think of this as your startup script or your default, where you're going to start from. And you'll see right here, this original path is core app kit Lua main. That corresponds to what I just showed you here. So core app kit lua main so this is your starting project if you just used the out of the box solution but instead what i've done is i've went ahead and rolled my own so we can see that here and that is set up to be script lua player which i went ahead and created you'll notice there's no file extensions used here so we go in here to the script folder off the root of our project lua and then player and this is just Lua code, very simple, straightforward. This is actually modeled off of their very, um, if you go into their documentation, which we will cover in a second, there is a kind of a starting script version in there. Uh, but what you'll see is the life cycle of the game engine, the game loop itself, calls back several functions. This is a very common way to do things in game engine. So basically it's looking for in that boot script, certain Lua functions that it's going to call periodically as the game loop executes. So we see here we've got the init function, which is called as the game uh, winds up. Uh, then we've got update, which is passed in the delta, the amount of time that elapsed since the last update. We've got render, which is responsible for actually drawing on the screen. And then finally shutdown, so when you are done. So this is where your program lifecycle comes. This is your game loop, essentially inverted. The game engine is running the game loop and calling your code by calling these methods. But this is essentially where the heart of your game is hooked up. And you see here we've got, uh, you know, simple. We create a world, create a viewport, create a shading environment. Uh, we're using built-in stuff. 
So we're built using built-in shaders from, again, that hierarchy of all this stuff that's right here. That's all your built-ins. So it'll also take the paths from that directory as well. Um, so that's what constitutes the core stuff. It's not just scripts in there. There's also FBX files, uh, materials, etc. all bundled in there. Stuff that quickly to get you up and going. Uh, create a camera, um, position the camera, and then finally, these ones I added. This one here uh, basically just says, go ahead, world, now go ahead and load my level. Load the level scene one, again, no extension. And then once that level is loaded, I take a reference to box and get unit by name by calling my cube. So I'm looking for a, a, a unit named my cube in the level we just loaded named scene one. So this is how your script can link back to uh, and pull into levels that we've created dynamically. Now let's go on back. Oh, and this is the script editor. Script editor, I guess I should cover it briefly. Uh, it's got uh, pretty much what you would expect from script editing, which is nice. Uh, we come down here, for example. Uh, so we created a world. I can go here and not get any IntelliSense, which is not making things demo well, uh, but you've got uh, a certain degree of IntelliSense. It's sorted very strangely, but you can um, you know, drag into or dive into objects fairly concisely there. You got syntax highlighting, as you've seen here. Uh, you've got code folding, like that. Uh, you can set a breakpoint, like that. Uh, step in, over, and above. Um, step, what is it? Step over, step in, step out. Yeah, uh, your standard step-by-step um, -step breakpoint controls. Now remember though, if you want to debug, you gotta run this guy, not this guy. So uh, that is a nutshell, the Lua coding experience. It's, it's not really that insane. I'll show you the documentation in a second. You can get an idea of how it's going, but this is the main loop we're seeing. There are other ways to code things. We can attach things to units directly and apply the logic that way. We're actually gonna do that using flow though in a minute. So you can see that experience as well. So as you can see here, this code simply loads the level by name, grabs the item called my cube, and then in update, da, 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 right here, so we update the world, and then here we check the location of our cube, decrement it by a little bit on the x-axis, and then update it accordingly. So very simple logic here. And if I go ahead and preview this guy, you will simply see, oh, this is annoying. This save all, there's no way to get rid of it. It asks you every single freaking time. And there's no, as far as I can tell, setting to say, stop asking me this, which causes your application to lose focus and hidden in the background. Please fix that, guys. Uh, but as you see, there is my game loop running and it's, you know, it's updating off across the x-axis like what we saw. So that hookup back, let me just shut you down and we will go over here into content levels scene one so this is scene one that we loaded and as you can see scene one contains my cube so that's how you can link the code so first off we, we created a main game loop so you can put whatever global level objects you uh, logic you see in there but you can also just as simply um, access dynamically loaded code uh, in the manner we just did so the, the link between uh, generated levels here and code is quite simple but the way you're going to probably control things is by actually attaching the code directly to the entities and that's what we will show you right now. But this time I'm gonna use flow instead. Now, this just allows me to do a couple things. First, it allows me to demonstrate the process of importing an asset, which is dog simple. So here I go, import, uh, go to, um, I have a new thing coming up. Basically, I'm creating a whole bunch of assets over time, as well as source code archives, etc., cetera, uh, that I'm making available to patron backers. So I'm, I've got this developing here which has uh, resources, uh, blunder projects, source code for prior examples, uh, semi uh, mini books I've done, etc. So the raw blender files for everything you're gonna see in future tutorials is available. Now, um, I'm just gonna be using a generated FBX file in this case, but this is a shipping container I model. And here you see the FBX importing process. Uh, you just kind of come in here, tell it, I, I don't, there's no animation here. Uh, bring in the textures, bring in everything else, bring in, there are no lights, there are no camera, but I actually don't want to bring those in anyways. And import. And that's the importation process. And you see it automatically creates a little preview for it down here. I can highlight it. And there is the shipping container we just imported. So now that we've got a shipping container, how do we instance one? Well, you drag and drop. That's it. Uh, so that is the involvement in bringing in a 3D asset and placing 3D asset. Nice and simple, like so. 
So now I'm gonna go ahead and run that, make sure that's actually on screen. Say yes to the stupid save all dialogue. And uh, yeah, focus down here. No, I'm not on screen. All right. Come on. There, that's for sure gonna be on screen. So go ahead and run that. And yep. Okay, I am doing something wrong. Uh, one second, let me figure out what I'm doing. Oh, that might be part of it. All right, this is a project that I've been playing around with, messing around with, making things in and out of. I'm just gonna go ahead and create one from scratch really quickly so we can just get this kind of stuff out of the way. I don't know if I've done something stupid in settings in the background, but I'll just start from a scratch. Um, actually, you know what, this is a quick enough process. I'll just do this live. So, uh, Stingray, yeah, sure, click go. Basic, fine. Plan B. No sense trying to debug something that I've no doubt introduced myself. So I'm just gonna do a quick new start. And again, we've, we've got this initial data compilation coming in here. I'll give that a second to run, and I will see you in a minute. All right, so now we're back. Uh, this is the basic project, uh, very straightforward, seemingly upside down, but this creates a um, configured level for you. See, so we can look around like that. So now I'm gonna exit out of that, go ahead and import an asset. Again, from my desktop, shipping container, Import. Oh, I don't know where I actually, imp oops. I just imported that into the scripts folder. All right, that was mildly stupid. Uh, it doesn't really matter though. Uh, so you can see here, we've got our model, the materials for that model. You can see there's a color map, a normal map attached to it. I'm just gonna grab these two. All right, so if I grab the material and move you into materials. Da -da 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 and grab the model, move you into models. So as you can see, you can uh, move models around. It's a little slow at times because it's doing stuff in the back end, but you can at least correct your mistakes like I just did. So here we go. Go ahead, instance our shipping container, like so. Get you above ground, like so. I can attach physics to it, etc. I'm not going to. We're just gonna go ahead and play. We will see our shipping container is now in the world like you. Now you see in the simple, it's already wired up a uh, player character controller for you. Uh, so controlling the mouse, move, etc. cetera. Uh, you've got walk hooked up, escape to exit. And if you come down here into scripts, you will see that is hooked up as player. And your logic is right there. So it's just basically doing a very simple starter application for you to get you up and going. So we got this guy in here. Now what I wanna do is make it do stuff. And I'm going to now demonstrate. So we've got an actor over here called shipping container. It is a unit. And now I want to use flow instead. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a new guy here called the unit editor. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, standalone application, but this is where you can make changes to units. Uh, we shall go ahead and do a file open. This will give you a list of all of the units available in your scene. In this case, I want the shipping container. And there we can nicely preview it. Uh, same controls. So there is our shipping container. Now let's go ahead and, well, so we can sum down uh, the modeling entity behind scenes. I was probably pretty boring and called it a cube. Uh, you can see you can set the various properties, uh, rendering settings, uh, script data attached to it. Data, not scripts, uh, but you can attach it. You can create state machines. Uh, very cool, very useful for AI, etc. But what we want to do in this particular case is demonstrate unit flow. So you see down here, we're looking at the viewport. Now we can go instead into unit flow. And unit flow is where we can use the flow programming language. Now, if you've used um, CryEngine, the newest version, or Unity, oh, sorry, Unreal Engine, their visual the blueprint system in uh, Unreal Engine, for example, this is very similar to that. Um, and this is another way that we can program 
what we are going to do with our guy here. So what we're going to do is move him. So we're going to take an input. So we've got various different inputs here, mouse, PS4 button, Xbox controller, etc. And we're just going to take a keyboard button. Uh, oh, come on, button name. And if you press M, for very arbitrary reasons, let's go because I'm named Mike. So on M, we're going to go ahead and do something. What we're going to do is move our character. So first off, we need to actually get where they are right now. So we just go uh, unit, get unit local, oh, get. All right, so unit, let me just see here, get unit local position. Don't know why I couldn't see that. So by default, the input here is me. So this object, this guy right here, Stingray Entity Root, which is ultimately shipping container. So this is passed in automatically here. But you'll notice left-hand side is inputs. We're defining this one as M, but it could have come from something. Actually, in this case, it couldn't. But right-hand sides are outputs. So we pass the position out as a result of this guy. And now what we want to do is take that guy and go into, I believe it's math. Uh, vector uh, addition like so and we take that guy as the one we're gonna add to and now we need a vector to come in was that under give me a second yeah vector data and we'll set its value as 0.1 zero and zero. So we're going to move it um, point 0.1 on the x-axis and then click OK and we just wire that into the other input like so. And then finally we need this. This is just a bunch of sets. So basically we have this code that is called on a per frame basis that says OK uh, I'm going to get the unit's position and I'm going to add point 0.01 to the x component. I'm also going to check to see if the key M is pressed. Not a really a lot of logic here. There's nothing, there's no go or actions here yet. Well, this guy is an action, but it doesn't do anything. So now what we want to do is bring in and actually connect it to something. So unit, uh, set unit local position like you. And here's where everything kind of all comes together. So on the, this is the M key event. When it is pressed, we will run this event. This guy will take as input the position, which is our previous position, incremented slightly. That's it. That is a script for wiring up a shipping container to handle the M key being pressed. I'll go ahead and save this guy. We shall head back over to the Stingray editor and run it. And press the M key. All right, so my axis is wrong, but you get the general idea. Uh, so I could just as easily come back in here, change that out. We will change your value to, I suppose we could change this into a, a subtraction if we really wanted to, uh, but we'll do it this way. Go ahead and save it. Go back over and run. And M key, and there you go. So that is how you can attach a flow to a unit and control it logic on a per frame update basis. It's very simple, very easy to do. Now you can also do very comparable to what we did with script. We could attach and control it via a script instead of a flow, but we already saw scripting earlier. Now one thing that we haven't seen, and this is the last thing we're going to cover before we get into some of the more mundane tasks here, is level flow. Now, level flow is attached to your particular level, and this is the same thing. This is a uh, neat little flow chart uh, logics of there's the various events it can respond to. So when the level is loaded, when it shuts down, and on a per frame update. So if you want to do uh, wire up flow controls on a uh, per frame basis for your entire level, exact same logic here. Right click to add in the thing you want to have uh, the nodes from hook them all up. You'll notice they're different here than we had in the other thing. We've got a couple more uh, options, more global level things, but you can control your level level logic using flow as well as you if you wish as well. So earlier on we did level stuff via Lua scripting and this time we did unit stuff via flow uh, scripting, but you can easily reverse the two and in fact you can actually tie the two together. So you see here script, uh, we can call a Lua script 
or a script global that has been registered. And Lua has the ability also to call into Flow. So the two can intercommunicate and they can also both talk to C++ code if properly configured. So that is essentially, in a nutshell, how the programming is done here. Obviously, I didn't go into a lot of depth. We are already at the 50-minute mark, so I'm not going to go much deeper. That's Stingray. Uh, essentially, that is the experience. It's a very streamlined program. They've, everything is very clean and well-designed, except for maybe that separation between entities and, and units, which is a little... Uh, and hopefully it's something that down the road gets fixed, but I got a feeling that's their legacy baggage. Every engine has a little bit of legacy baggage, and that is definitely Stingrays. But for the most part, all the rest of this stuff is very clean. The, the logic is clean. The tools are clean. They work. Um, it can always split up into various, you know, uh, tasks, modules. They've, they've broken out the logic here pretty well. You can uh, work standalone to the, the main editor, so if you don't actually need the entire editor open to do you know, just some level editing or just some script coding or etc. Um, and then what they don't have built into the engine is added via third party, which is kind of first party because they own a lot of these companies. But then you've got scale form for UI, Weiss for audio, Navigation Lab for AI and pathfinding, etc. So it's all tied in there pretty nicely. There are some things I don't understand or haven't really got into that much or some more advanced things. Oh, and then there's this guy. This one I should definitely cover. There's the creative market. And this is becoming increasingly important with game engines. Uh, Unreal Engine has one, Unity has one, and Stingray has one. It is a marketplace where you can buy stuff. So as you can see here, here is a streetscape. It ultimately brings you to a web page. But why are you asking me this stuff? That's annoying. Oh, they've outsourced it. That's stupid. Uh, but there is an integrated marketplace in here for buying assets directly in the, well, somewhat directly in the engine. I guess it brings you out here. But there is an asset store. So if you do need things, there are things. Uh, you can, uh, come on back. Uh, you can switch down to particular types here. Uh, so you can bring in a potentially rigged character to drop into your, uh, world. The prices are all pretty reasonable, very similar to uh, Unity's asset store. Now, as you can see at the very top here, it, when I was back at all, the entire market is comprised of 426 items, and there's no code or add-ons or modules or anything that way, so it's basically all just assets. But it's nice that it's there. Hopefully it grows in time. This stuff is a huge time saver for people that are you know looking for placeholder art um, to get up and going. So that is there. It is available. Kind of cool. Now, the last thing to cover here is their community and documentation. This is always important uh, to any game engine. A well-documented game, game engine, in my humble opinion, a well-referenced game engine is essential. If it's got crap documentation, <coughs> it's, just, um, it's really hard to justify going ahead and using it. And thankfully, that isn't the case for Stingray. Stingray actually has, and we'll go on in here, very, very good documentation. So this is your Stingray Learning Center. It's the heart of it. You've got a number of uh, pieces here for, you know, you want to learn about animation, you come in here, and all the various topics that are in there. Each one is covered fairly well with links back to associated topics. Uh, covers a pretty broad section. Pretty much everything I wanted to know about the engine was in here when I went ahead and looked. It is well documented that way. And then most importantly, we come down here, we've got the Lua API reference. So let's do it by namespace. No, let's do it by... Uh, category. So here you can see the various, so here's say we're working with units. Here is the unit APIs, etc. So unit light, there's the various functions, the parameters, etc. So it is a well-documented, well-referenced engine. At the same time, flow also gets the same um, treatment. So say we're working on flow animation. There is the documentation of the input and output nodes and what each one does. So this is a very well-documented engine, especially the reference material. I always like to see that. It's good to be there. On top of that, they have done several videos. So there's a getting started videos here for the basics. So basically everything we just did, you can watch it in a one minute videos, little excerpts of it. Uh, and come on back here, video tutorials. They have created, uh, it's all on YouTube, but they have created several videos. Uh, and in the, let's go, I just want the Stingray channel. Well, you can also get information on the other pieces like Beast, IK, so there, Stingray. 
and there are, are you in my way? Hmm. Not really sure exactly how many there are. These are all playlists. So three, three, four, four, oh, okay. probably there, 21. So there are several videos to get you up and running. Uh, I went through a couple of them. They're pretty good quality. They're clear enough. They're, they move at a decent pace. So the learning material is there. What you need to get up and going is there. And most importantly, what you need to keep going, the reference material is there. Now, next up, we get into the community. And the community is this. Uh, basically, there's this forum. I, I loaded this yesterday. Let's refresh it for today. Uh, questions are being answered, so that's always critical. Um, but they're not being asked at an extreme rate. Actually, today's not bad. So today we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So six active conversations today. You can see replies are there. So people working in, so import an asset via Lua is a question. And a quick answer. Um, the staff, the people you see supporting it, uh, the faces over here are quite uh, active in actually answering questions. The community is not large. Uh, you know, you're not going to find like the Unity forums where you've got thousands upon thousands upon thousands of developers. But there is a community, which is actually more you can say for some model desk products. So that is there is a place where you can go when you run into trouble. Uh, but there isn't really, you know. Uh, you know, a totally off topic type, let's hang out here kind of community built around this product. And I don't know if there's any real successful third party communities that do uh, talk about Stingray. So you're gonna be in definitely a smaller pond if you work with Stingray as opposed to uh, Unreal or Unity. But the community is there, the questions are there, they are answering, questions are not going unanswered. And that's frustrating when you're working with a smaller scale game engine and you ask a question and there's nobody out there to answer it. That can be a pretty big deal breaker, especially if you, you know, you're stuck. So the developers are active at support this thing, uh, which is good. And that is essentially it. It is a uh, great little game engine if you can handle the negatives. And the negatives we've gone through pretty clearly. There's, uh, if you're looking for a pure C++ engine, this probably isn't for you. But increasingly these days, to be honest, if you're looking for a pure C++ game engine, there's no game engine for you. The closest you come is probably Unreal Engine. And even it is a layer above C++ if you want to put it. They've created a memory manager, a complete new language essentially on top of C++, etc. So that is not there. If you're looking at supporting um, Mac OS or Linux or you're running your develop tools on those ones, that's definitely a deal breaker. And of course it's 30 bucks a month. That gets you Maya LT. Uh, so if you are looking for a content creation uh, 3D application and a game engine, that is a great price. Uh, if you're a diehard um, Modo, Blender, um, Cinema 4D, etc. user looking for a game engine, the value proposition isn't so good. Now what I would actually like to see from Autodesk is either a um, geared to income or slightly cheaper straight subscription version of Stingray standalone from Maya LT. So you actually can buy it for a little bit cheaper and work with another engine, or you can have it so if you make less than a hundred grand a year or something, it's free to use with another tool. It'd be nice to see them go that route, but I don't see it because I see them using Stingray as a driver for Maya and Maya as a driver for Stingray. So that relationship is not going anywhere. So I wouldn't even be surprised at some point if they turn them into the same product, which would be a shame. Uh, but that definitely there is a coupling there. And it only really makes sense from a value perspective if you are interested in Maya. Now, on the other hand, I have experience with Maya. I am a fan. It's a, it's a nice product. I would choose it over 3D Studios Max any day. Um, it's very mouse-centric, uh, but it is a great, great, great content creation solution. So if you are looking for both, you're looking for a game engine and uh, modeling tools, and you've got 30 bucks or 240 a year, this is definitely one of those things to check out. If that price tag isn't doable for you, there's tons of options out there. Again, we loop back to uh, here, Game From Scratch, you can see a few dozen of them and help choose the best one, uh, just like the coverage we had here. But that's about it. I can't really say much more about it. Uh, if you saw what you saw, you either probably like it or you're not interested at this point, and that is the exact idea behind this series. So that is Stingray. If you've got any questions or comments, please discuss them down below. I, I love those types of conversations. Uh, please don't knee jerk, just hate on it being Autodesk or hate on the fact that it's got a price tag attached because you know what? All things can't be all things to all people. 
Um, some things hit a certain niche. It's a good product. It, it has its place. That place may not be in your toolbox. That doesn't mean you should dislike it as a result. It's like being mad at a Porsche because you can't afford it. And I'm not comparing this to a Porsche to say, you know, it's better or superior, or et cetera. It's literally just a different pricing model. In some cases, Stingray's price is going to be vastly superior to, for example, Unreal Engine. If your game makes a bucket of cash, Stingray is as cheap as they get. And if you're somewhere in that middle where you make a certain amount of money and have a certain size team, it's also cheaper than Unity. So pr comparing prices between game engines is not an easy thing to do these days. And certain people have a certain fit with a certain engine. Certain people don't. But that's not really a reason to write off an engine completely. Now, it's a reason for you not to use it. I get that completely. But it doesn't make the engine bad. It doesn't make the engine's business model bad. All things don't need to be free in this day and age. It's just a question, is there value there in what they're charging? And if you're getting Maya, LT, and Stingray, the answer is, oh my god, yes, there is value in that combination. When you start moving away from not using Maya, LT, or if you have absolutely no money, obviously that gets a little bit different. All right, so we just hit the one hour mark. That is all I'm going to say for now. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm Mike at Game From Scratch. I will see you soon. Bye.